Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. The Killer Women Vodcast is pleased to be a part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. To learn more about Danielle and her books, visit her at www.daniellegerard.com and to access all of our vodcasts, go to youtube.com forward slash authors on the air. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with 4 million listeners. I'm your host, suspense author Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Kate Hollihan. Kate is a screenwriter and USA Today best selling suspense novelist. The Darkness of Others, her sixth solo standalone book and seventh published work, will be published on. August 23rd from Hachet's Grand Central Publishing. Her last work, Young Rich Widows, an audible original written with best-selling authors Vanessa Lilly, Kimberly Bell, and Lane Fargo, was a number one audio original and top five audio fiction book in the U.S. And actually, we had um, the cast of Young Rich Widows, uh, the writers of Young Rich Widows, on the show, so you can go back and watch that, which was super fun. And Kate's work has been published in multiple language, option for film and television, and her thriller script, Deadly Estate, is being produced by Mar Vista for Fox. Wow! Welcome, Kate! Hi! Thank you so much for having me, Danielle. Thank you. Absolutely. It's great to have you. I love your book. So before we get into all sorts of things, tell our listeners a little bit about The Darkness of Others. Sure. So The Darkness of Others uh, is a story about Amani Banks. She's a therapist that's living in Brooklyn Heights, uh, an area of Manhattan. And uh, her best friend's husband is shot dead and her best friend goes missing, presumably on the run after killing her spouse. And Imani is certain that her friend wouldn't have done this uh, despite not seeing her for a bit because of the pandemic and everybody being in very close quarters where uh, there's been additional stress on marriages and relationships and everything. And so Imani uh, decides that the police aren't taking the disappearance seriously enough since they think she's just on the run. And she goes to figure out what really happened. And so that's kind of the crux of the story. And of course, there's a there's a subplot where her husband's restaurant, um, Michelin star restaurant is failing and he brings in a, uh, a woman who he's furloughed, who's been on the wait staff and allows her to rent a room in their town home, uh, partially because he feels bad and also to bring in some extra income. And she's involved uh, with the dead director in a way that Imani thinks might have, you know, meant that she had something to do with this death and she can't get her out of the house because there's an eviction moratorium during COVID. So you, um, renters all stayed. <laughs> yes. Which, you know, which is it, one of those things where it's a, a, the policy makes sense. You don't want right. a lot of people losing their homes during right. COVID. But of course, as a thriller writer, I was thinking, well, what if there was a murder in your house? Like, what would you do? You know, right. Right. Exactly. And that would be and I, that would be not ideal. So, um, you know, you set this book during the pandemic. So what, what tell us about the motivation for that? Okay, so I knew that was a risk. And I'm still waiting to see what happens. But, you know, all my other books had I, I write contemporary fiction, um, Young Rich Widows aside, which is set in the 1980s. But all of my solo books are, are really kind of take place in the, in the, you know, near near when the reader is is reading so and when and during near the publication date so I I kind of felt that if I shied away from COVID that was me um kind of changing form a little bit maybe not being honest to what I've done in the past because you know when I wrote The Widower's Wife the financial crisis was happening and so there was a financial crisis and I do try to do it where um you know, COVID's in the book where there's not people sick and dying, which is obviously but uh, what was happening. But uh, you also have just the psychological, the fear and the stress and the not knowing, um, you know, who you can invite into your circle and how making your circle smaller adds stressors and forces people to, um, to get things that they used to get from a broader 
uh, social circle all of a sudden from a very small group of people and how that also adds tension. So I wanted to just kind of acknowledge and speak to those things yeah. while also telling an entertaining thriller and not, you know, admiring people in kind of the death and destruction part, but, um, but addressing the psychological issues that happened. Yeah. Right. And in fact, there was a, um, a review of The Darkness of Others in the New York Journal of Books where it said that the book is as much a psychological investigation of the impact of lockdown as a domestic thriller. And that really seemed to ring true for you, I know. So talk a little bit about that. Like it's, it's a part of this, maybe we're not really recognizing it yet. I feel like it's certainly not something that we're seeing yet in, in a lot of fiction, but that's a, it's a, another character in the book right? The idea. Yes. It is. And I, I, you know, I also wanted to, um, most of my characters, my point of view characters are women. And I really wanted to show uh, what happened to women during the pandemic when kind of the broader support systems were lost. And you have some women that have children that are now juggling careers and also being a teacher and also being a state, you know, also being like the stay at home mom and, and on all the time in like three different jobs. And then you have in one character is a single mom who now finds that her, her child care is gone and she doesn't have a husband or a spouse to really share the duties. So it's it's really all her. And I, I kind of I so that was another thing that I wanted to to bring in was just like the additional stress on women during this mm -hmm. time. Uh, not that men didn't have it as well, but I think. Uh, there have been a lot of studies that said it disproportionately fell on women. Right, right. right. That we took like two, it's a, we just a huge step back for, because in many cases, if you had two working parents, you know, and, and in the case of Imani and her husband who runs a restaurant, I mean, it was, you know, the, the, the burden, even if the jobs were equal, the burden oftentimes fell on the woman, just sort of by the nature of, of how, you know, our nurturing or, and a tradition that we're in charge. And then oftentimes women had to step back in their roles. So they lost a lot of footage in their careers. Uh, right. And that's a lot, has a lasting impact. So it, you know, and you're right, of course, men had it, everybody had it hard. It was a horrible, I mean, it was a difficult time for everybody, but I, I of course, women, um, was a, it, the impact was we certainly felt harder on women. So I think that's a really fair point. And I like that you investigate that because I think um, I think it's important to recognize sort of what the impact of that will be for us for, you know, years to come and for the students who lost ground at school and all that stuff, right? Right. So that's, yeah. So I, I just felt like I was being honest to the experience that I was seeing and I was trying to reflect the world around me while also telling an entertaining story. And I, right. I hope I did that, but I do yes. understand that there will be some people that's like too soon. And for those yeah. people, I go, okay, like, you know, well, the book, the book will still be in stores in a year. <laughs> exactly. Pick it up later. Well, and actually, though, it's, it's to your point about the pandemic part of it. Um, I didn't experience while I was reading the book, this, the sense of like, oh, my God, I remember what this was like, because, of course, I wasn't, my husband wasn't a restaurant owner. And, you know, and, and we didn't have a stranger living in our house. And so it, it very much feels like, and obviously there, you didn't, what you didn't deal with, which I appreciate because of course we're still dealing with the traumatic, you know, after effects of the deaths of COVID. There wasn't like a sick person who we were, I mean, they were, everyone was worried about getting, you know, sick to some extent, but it, it didn't. So the parts of COVID that I felt like most of us experienced were not, you know, they weren't in the book. So it's, it's set in COVID, but it's, it's not a COVID story, if you will. I don't know how to explain that any better. You know what I'm talking about. And I think, you know, listeners, I don't think you're going to be in there thinking, oh my God, it's, we're talking about COVID. Um, yeah. So it's a very much a suspense story, but it, it does, there is some real additional, you know, tension and conflict and suspense that came from um, that time. So I think that's, it's, it's very relevant and it, it, it's really entertaining. So tell me, you were writing this during that time. You have two young girls. Um, so what was it like to, you know, to be writing in, in that moment? For Weirdly, even though authors spend so much time alone, a lot of authors said that was really hard. Yes. Um, well, I think it was in the, you know, the early days were extremely hard when the, when the school shut down yeah. uh, from March on, because it just, it, it all of a sudden, the, my, my kids are younger. And so you, the school has to be more led. I can't just sit there and go, 
you know, here's, here's a book and a list of things you're supposed to do. You kind of have right. to go through it. So, um, and that was happening during my day when I would normally write. Right. So uh, it was a lot of kind of shifting things and staying up late and writing and waking up really early and writing. Um, but it got done. And I think, yeah. but I do, but I did feel like, geez, and I, and I was fortunate in that um, we weren't in a career where all of a sudden, you know, my husband had lost his job on top of it, or there was financial stress or, uh, so I understand that I got off easy compared to right. a lot of other families, but, um, but yeah, I do think that we haven't fully processed it and that pretty soon we're going to look back and we're going to go, Oh my gosh. Yeah. That I think we're just like, right now, we're just so happy that the death toll is down and that they're vaccines right. that, right. that we're, we're kind of having that joy of it. But I think that we're going to have to look back and say, take some stock over Yes, to how stressful that was when right. our large support systems really shut down because work couldn't completely shut down. Deadlines for books still existed. People still had right. to earn money. Kids still had to learn. Right. And, and so it all had to happen, but in this very small household unit. And I yeah. think that that's pretty, pretty stressful. It is. <laughs> Yeah. And, and even more stressful, I, I think, you know, in the case of people living like in New York City, where, you know, the, the wealthy, wealthy New Yorkers, of course, went upstate to their, you know, bigger homes and had more space. But a lot of people living in a, you know, 700 square foot apartment with four people, um, all of a sudden, you know, they are really packed in there. So that was another way of it sort of added intensity. So yeah, we, yeah. we did get, we certainly did get off easy and my children were in college. So not so much, they were here, which was weird, but not so much having to sort of, you know, ma I mean, more managing than you'd think, but anyway. Um, so I think a lot of non-writers are, are often curious about sort of how authors get their ideas, you know, how stories emerge in our brains. And so how, for you, how does stories, you know, emerge? Is it a character that drives it or an idea? Is it the same every uh, time? Know, it really uh, changes. I think with this one, uh, I read about that um, eviction moratorium mm -hmm. and my thriller brain immediately went, well, but what if somebody was living in your house and you can't get them out? And then, or, or uh, at first right. it was, forget even if they were a murderer, it was just, what if, you know, you had somebody uh, like a roommate that wasn't as strict about quarantining as you were and right. you feel like they could kill you. Right? right, and then I kind of said, even worse. <laughs> what if you think this person's been involved in a murder? Right. Um, so that was where that one came from. Um, I actually just went to a friend's birthday party, and I was playing this game where I asked everyone to give me their occupation and um, a little bit about themselves, like what they liked or hated, and then I told them why they would kill someone, which I realized oh is God. just the way. That's awesome. Right. <laughs> so it was fun, but I think that, yeah, I guess I, I, I'm always kind of wondering um, who people are and what their limit would be and what, you know, how they would respond to certain situations and when people would, would rise and be a hero and when they might, um, you know, do something that makes them the villain. And so I think that when you, you kind of think that way, the story ideas just come. That's a really interesting way of thinking about people. I mean, I suppose we all do that in some way or another, but I've never put it together quite like that. And I like it. I can think of a few neighbors who I know exactly why they would kill somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, so, okay. So now when you have, so when you figure out your idea is, do, are you an outliner? Do you develop story as you go? I'm a big plotter. I, I sit there with um, an Excel spreadsheet, which uh, my father was an accountant and tried to teach me how to use Excel for math and um, it never caught on. But I realized that it was very convenient being able to move cells of text if I was yeah. switching around where chapters would go. So, um, so anyway, so I use Excel for that. And there's these, I just have these like long plots and then I write and then the characters push the story in a way that sometimes is not fitting with my plot and then I stop and I either go back and go well how if I really like the way the story was going in the plot and they go how can I structure this with different people so this can you know go according to plan or if that's not possible then how can I take the characters I have 
and you know adjust the plot so it grows more organically from what they are willing to do. So you said back and forth for you. Yes. How is it for you? How do you find well, it? Well, that's so funny. I'm a I'm a panzer, but I I use Excel. I use numbers because I'm a Mac user, and I do the yeah. same sort of thing. I have the chapter number, point of view, character, and sort of a snippet of what they do. But right. I oftentimes do that for the first like six or seven chapters just to kind of feel like I know my way into the book. And then I kind of find I ignore it for the next, you know, 300 pages. And then I'm like, oh, huh. So I'm, I'm and then I'm a massive rewriter. So it's not, I like the idea. I always like every time I talk to somebody who's, whose method sounds so sane, I think I'm going to try that. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not a good, I'm not a great outliner. I just, I can't quite figure out where things are going to go until they're happening. Well, I think also I'm an outlier because a lot of times, well, at least for me, we're, we're selling on the treatments, yes. right? So I'm right. So I feel like I've already kind of done this extensive <laughs> outline right. to get to get the book sold. So I'm trying to like, you know, figure out how I can deliver something that hopefully is better than even what I pitched, but right. um, you know, isn't like a completely different book entirely. That's sort of what I do. I feel like it's a completely different book. I mean, it's the same character. So I've always written series, which makes it easier, right? Because you are, they already know the character that they're getting. Um, right. But the book story ends up being a little off the rails. But um, yeah, it's an, it is, it's an interesting process because everybody's is so different. Um, but it's actually that's thoughtful. Like if you've already sort of, if you've done a treatment for the book, then you've really established. So you're doing a lot of pre-work before you're mm -hmm. writing in order to sell the book? Is it, are you usually a one book deal? You do two book deals? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it depends. I think Crooked Lane was a uh, kind of two at a time. And then yes. I think Hachette uh, is, uh, is kind of like one with an option. And yeah. so each time it tends to- So you basically yeah. are, you're like, this is, so now here's my option idea and here's my, yeah. So that is, yeah. and I actually think in some ways that maybe that helps keep you know, you know, keep you in your, like, keep you smart on the story before you start and you don't wander off and write something completely random, which I think is what generally happens to me. <laughs> so um, I want to talk about uh, uh, another, we sort of have touched about on motherhood and the idea of, um, you know, of, of these, you know, the burdens and so on. Um, and I want to sort of talk about motherhood because of course there's three women, three mothers in this story. And um, one of the sort of big themes, which I, I love because it, of course, rings so true to, I think, women in general and particularly mothers, is the idea of protecting the children. Like, you know, what, and I get shivers when I talk about it, like what extents we would go to. And the reason Imani does not believe um, that her friend has taken off, right, is because Imani is taking care of, of her daughter. So, you know, talk about like the process of, you know, sort of the, the aspect of these three mothers and your own experience as a mother and how that sort of informed um, the world of the book. Yeah, well, I think um, a lot of mom guilt probably informed the world of the book because I think that we were all faced with a situation where we we're trying to do the best for our kids and keep them safe and healthy, but also not damage them psychologically, right? Especially for children, we have, I mean, there's a lot of studies that say after a certain age, they get a lot of their endorphins from their peer groups, right? right? So if their parents are like, oh, you're doing great and everything's fine. It's like in one ear and out the other, what they care about is the, um, right. the affirmation from their friends. And so I think that was another thing that happened with COVID is kind of figuring out well, how much isolation is you keeping your kids safe versus, you know, right. maybe causing more damage, right? right. And I think that, um, you know, I think I erred on the side of having a pretty tight bubble, but that was also my worry constantly. And so I think these women in the book deal with it differently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think Imani kept a pretty tight ship and a yeah. tight bubble. And then she's wondering if in doing that, um, you know, she was not there for a friend in the way that she should have been. And that could have led to tensions in the marriage that maybe erupted in this horrible way, uh, which she feels particularly bad about since she is a therapist. Right. Feels like she right. would, she should um, be especially sensitive to that. And I think uh, when they're taking care of their kids, you can see that Amani's not sure when there's another woman who part of her empathetically wants to go, oh, this woman is being furloughed from my husband's restaurant after she's worked there for a really long time. And she has a daughter who goes right. to my kid's school on scholarship. And I really should be um, 
magnanimous and, and welcome these people into my home. But what if this woman and her kids make my kids sick? <laughs> right, right, right. And so, exactly. And so I think it, it also it put a lot of people in, with these moral dilemmas where um, they want to protect their family and that's their first priority. But at the same time, they want to be a good person. And they want to be a good friend and a good community member. And so how do you strike that balance? And I think to your point, like protecting our children, in the beginning, it was very clear cut or or we were told it was very clear cut, right? You just, you keep them away from everybody. But as the months wore on, the psychological damage of that, um, you know, weighed on all of us and perhaps most, you know, obviously on the kids, right? Because they don't have all the, you know, the sort of, you know, emotional intelligence of adults uh, for what it's worth to be like, okay, this is not the rest of our lives. And for those of the kids that it was such an important time in their life, that was, um, that was, you know, really a struggle. And I get the mom guilt. I think that's something probably that we, you know, I still feel today and my kids are, they clearly don't need me, um, you know, 24 seven, but I still think there were times when I was like, you got to leave me alone to write. Um, Yeah. So, and you're not just writing and raising kids. You're also in the middle of grad school. Can you, <laughs> is this related to your writing? <laughs> Maybe that's it. I, I went nuts. No, um, yeah, I think that, so I think the isolation, I said, well, you know what? Maybe I just need to be around people in school or at least if it's a Zoom setting or something because all of our conferences were canceled. And yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I started to maybe feel like, who the heck am I? You know, and and so, and and so I applied to uh, NYU Tisch's School of a uh, of Dramatic, uh, well, film school, and I am getting my MFA in screenwriting, and uh, and this is I'm going into my my last year, and then I'll have my degree. So That's and awesome. also, I think I think too, I was aware that um, you know, the bookstores were closed but people were glued to their televisions. Yeah. And that was not lost on me. <laughs> yes. So, That's, well, I, so my brother went to Tish. He's a uh, filmmaker <laughs> and I got my MFA. It's interesting to have stopped my career after f- I got it after f- uh, five books, but I think it is a really, in- and I just got it in creative writing, but I still think it's an, in- going back to school as an adult, when you know what you want to do and you love what you're doing is really fun. Right. It is. I'm, I'm also really old for the program. So it's like, this, it is, you know, it's because- I don't um, believe that, but you don't I look mean, like you're- Well, I mean, but it's, you know, the, like there are a lot of people I'm in class with and some of them are closer in age to my 13 year old or my soon to be 13 year old than they are to me. And so it's, um, it's, this, it's this weird thing, you know, where I, I, I find it really interesting and I'm able to focus, I think in a way that I- might not be if I was younger but I also think that you know they have a lot of like like Thursday night drinks and Friday night which right. is great for them. I totally understand but I'm like I gotta get home because right. kids only have babysitting for this long and right. you know and uh, and so that makes me kind of the fuddy-duddy in a way that I never was as an undergrad I would like them to know <laughs> of course you're like it's a different world you wait you wait guys you wait so that's exciting. So d- did the screenwriting start as an evolution from this, from the program or were you doing that before? Um, you know, I had written a, a couple before, but I think, cause I had, you know, um, a, like one, one book optioned. And then I found that when I would offer like, oh, I can write the screenplay. It was kind of like, oh no, no, you know, we just, we just want the rights to the book and we'll get a screenwriter yeah. on it. And, and, um, well, I think that that's, that's great. And there's some amazing screenwriters. It's also a difficult proposition because a lot of screenwriters want to write their own stuff. You know, these right. are, so, um, so I thought, well, maybe I'll just learn screenwriting. And, um, and then once I have the degree, you know, start being able to adapt to my own work. So I thought that that was really the impetus of it, but the actual yeah. thing that I saw just a straight screenplay. <laughs> it was never yeah, the deadly estate. Yes. So tell us about that. Um, I wrote it. Uh, so it's it's interesting. I think a lot of the way screenwriting seems to work is that you write a lot of these things and people use that as a sample to show you can write. And then they kind of say, 
But what we're really interested in yeah, yeah. Is, is this. And so I had a few um, book adaptations that I think got my foot in the door. And then I, um, I wrote something for class that was based on someone saying, oh, you know, we'd really like to do something that somehow touched on the great resignation and people being very frustrated about, uh, you know, deciding that there are certain things they just won't do and that they're not going to work like a certain way anymore. Right. And I thought, and they were like, if we could get a thriller around that. And so I thought, okay. And I, um, I came up with this story, Deadly Estate, where um, there's a fancy hotel and this woman is the director of operations at the hotel. And, you know, she puts up with a lot of very entitled, crappy behavior from people that are on vacation and just feel like they can throw caution to the wind and that there's someone to clean up their mess. And, right, right. And so there's a murder. And uh, <laughs> and so uh, she, uh, some of the things that she was doing uh, make make her a suspect. And then she she ends up quitting in fabulous fashion and trying to figure out what actually happens, both to clear I her name. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a fun one. Um, and so actually that's in production. It goes, it's in production this month. And that's so be, exciting. Yeah, it's a streaming movie, not on the big screen, but, but streaming. So I, I feel like that's where we want to be anyway, right? Isn't that where we're going to reach the most people? People still don't go to the theaters the way they used to, right? Right. And who, and so, where uh, will we find it? Where will it be? When do you know when and where? Uh, I'm not exactly sure the timing, um, but I know it will be on Fox. Uh, so Fox is streaming platforms. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, it's kind of, it's an interesting world because once uh, you're done and you've done all the developmental edits and the polishes and you've been paid out, uh, your input's no longer needed. <laughs> uh -huh, I love it. You're like, okay, well, you cut my check, I guess, you know, um, yeah. It's different than a book where like you see it all the way through. They're just yeah. kind of like, okay, we got it from here. I Which is, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Like, it'll be fun to see the final project, but in some ways the whole, like, you know what, you know, you marketing your book and being out there doing this kind of thing. It's kind of nice to skip that, right? You're like, yes. as much as you love to talk to me, the whole publish, the whole publicity thing is, it's a lot, it takes a lot of time and energy. So you were talking about something before we started that you were learning about for another screenplay, maybe? Yes. Oh, um, okay. So I love this. So, um, so I'm also pitching this as a as a book, but um, it started it did start off as a screenplay, but um, it's about frogging. So there is a docu yeah, you, series. I, I have, have no played. idea. Yeah, I have no idea. So, frogging is when uh, people live in someone else's house while the while the homeowners are still there. So if you can imagine, kind of like what happened with Parasite with those people in the basement. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's a real thing, and it actually happens a decent amount in America because people have McMansions where there's a lot of space and there are places where people can hide, and also people have second homes, um, and people will move into, like, let's say someone's beach house, and then when the family comes in, they, like, that's where they've been living, so they kind of hide in the nooks and crannies of the house, and so there's this docu-series of people who actually kind of confronted their froggers or found out about these people and they've been living in like crawl spaces or attics or and they would notice like food missing and blame it on other people in the house or you know some cleanse their clothing was missing there was there was this one story where there were these girls who were in a dorm room and they had like a triple and their clothing kept going missing um, and I guess one of the roommates kind of seems like she had a boyfriend who's place she stayed at a lot and that was yeah. the person kind of was like camping out there coming in late and leaving before they uh, you know went to class and knew all their schedules and you know so it's a it's scary but also kind of right for writing a thriller right for it, sure for sure well god and I'm gonna have to check out my closets although I don't have I, a McMansion <laughs> so it makes me appreciate that my house isn't really that big Yikes, that is super, super creepy. Well, that's exciting. So, um, okay, wait, so now before we talk about what's next, it sounds like maybe, is that the book you're working on then? Yes, well, so that's the one that, um, well, I'll see what happens with the pitch, but that's the, that's the pitch that's in. And um, 
And then I'm also, you know, I have grad school. So I have a few scripts that are going there and I have yeah. um, um, a, a pilot show Bible off of one little secret that uh, I'm in the process of pitching to networks with a, with a production company. So hopefully that, hopefully that goes. And then, um, and then, you know, yeah. So the, and there's a, a couple other things that we're not announcing yet that are, that are secret in the works with, uh, so Okay, so, so I yeah. shouldn't talk about this. I shouldn't talk about the the other thing. We'll wait. Yeah. We'll wait to hear about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so Kate, it's like I feel like I need like a biography of what is happening in the world of Kate Hallahan. But to start, we have the darkness of others coming on September twenty seventh. Is that right? No, it actually it's already out. It just came out. Um, ah! Oh my God, I'm so clueless. It just came out? It just came out August 23rd, whatever the Tuesday Oh, was. I'm off by a month. Okay, you can get it right now. <laughs> That's my own brain, totally not working very well. Okay, so you have this. And then the next thing we're looking at is hopefully the Frogger story. That's my at hope. At least for yeah. the readers. Okay. Well, I got my fingers crossed because I have to say, I've not heard of frogging. Um, and it's it absolutely sounds like a... Um, perfect setup for a very creepy story and it's like you said I like the fact that you are like literally doing the great resignation which you know I we're reading so much about everybody you know the people leaving their jobs because it's too much work for not enough pay um and the idea that um I guess those people need some place to live so oh, are God. they <laughs> they're not necessarily the froggers I was just kidding but anyway that whole like the fact that you are really talking about things that are happening right now is really really fascinating so well I'm excited to read um what people think about the darkness of others I've had I had a lot of people respond to my posts on um and say that they um loved it so I think it's um really exciting and I think you do a wonderful job of dealing with the pandemic in a in a way that is important to talk about right how hard it was um and, and of course if you don't care about how hard the pandemic was it's just a real it's a fast paced page turner thriller so nice job kate all right well so. we will um look forward to having you tell everybody where to find you your website and stuff and um for books yeah so um i'm at uh katehollahan.com uh, so that's uh, C-A-T-E-H-O-L-A-H-A-N.com. And uh, same thing on all the socials, because um, if I had to change the name, it would uh, I, I wouldn't be able to keep track of myself. So uh, it's, it's true. You're, it's, I'm glad that worked out. That did not, that was not, did not work out for me, but I love it. Okay. So go find Kate Hallahan everywhere. Enjoy the darkness of others. And Kate, I hope you'll come back um, with w when you have a new book. Yes. I would love that. And thank you so much for having me on, Danielle. Thank you. Absolutely. Everybody, thanks for joining us on Killer Women, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.